So the talk is called Translations from Architectural History, Image Model and Drawing. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about the title um, in, in a couple of slides. But um, essentially, it's concerned with how, um, let's say, architects, huh, as opposed to tourists or the general public, if we want to call uh, it as such, uh, engages with the building. And how actually, um, let's say, instruments, which are usually associated with the practicing of architecture, um, rather than its study, may be adopted as a means of instigating new ways of looking at buildings. So I, I always like to begin with this slide from Thomas Struth, where you have in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence, this kind of masked tourists um, in a spectacular sort of Renaissance building, uh, completely clueless as to how or what they are to look at things. So as I was saying before, so I, I like to start with this image, which kind of depicts uh, a bunch of tourists at the museum, completely clueless as to how, um, how they are to engage you know, with the, the artifacts which surround them, including the building, uh, the, uh, the artwork which is displayed. And in a way, today's, today's talk is really about how, uh, as I said before, one can harness the instruments which usually are associated with the practicing of architecture to uh, instigate new or more profound ways of, uh, of studying buildings, from, in this case from the past, but including from the present. So of course, in my own sort of, uh, how do you say, uh, work or way of, of looking at architecture, I was, I've been extremely sort of influenced by my own activity as, as teacher and especially at the AA. So here you see, for instance, uh, one of the very first student trips I, I participated in as a tutor. Um, I think the, the first or the second year, uh, Monia uh, became director of the program when we went to Venice to um, study and look at a bunch of uh, buildings from the Renaissance, uh, especially Palladio buildings. So here you see three first year students uh, with their pencils and sort of um, notebooks at hand, uh, engaging actively with uh, the building in front of them. Now, I remember how in the context of my own brief for the time, uh, rather than asking students to draw, I had given them a series of sheets with plans and images of the buildings and they were asked instead to erase with a tipex uh, sort of brush everything they thought um, was unimportant in, in a way to their own understanding and reception of the building. So in a way to erase uh, so much of the building until let's say a few essential aspects were uh, highlighted which amounted to their own reading of the building. So, for example, on the left, you see a drawing uh, of Sasha, which says, actually, you know, um, what do you see yeah, now? Maria Formosa is, is really... People at the museum people looking up. Thomas Truth, yes. Thomas Truth. Yeah. Exactly. Um, now it should work, yeah, because I see, I see green lights where on the right, for instance, right. instance yeah. Bodo was more interested in, uh, um, I think it's in, in this case, Codussi's uh, sort of views of parallel walls um, as a means to kind of apportion the space of the church inside. Now, the title, as I said before, uh, as I showed before, is Translations from Architectural History, precisely because, uh, in a way, I, I think um, drawings, producing drawings, or recording history through, through mediums, no? through, through uh, let's say, documents, which are not really the building, but are a translation of the building in another sort of um, mode of expression is one of the most uh, kind of crucial um, instruments which may distinguish a way in which, for instance, an architect uh, relates to a building as opposed to uh, a tourist or a member of the general public. And in this act of translation, um, of course, this act of translation is not simply a copying of the building, but it always in some way involves a, uh, a sort of, um, how do you say, a reinvention of the subject which is depicted uh, uh, by way of the means through which it is described. So in this brief presentation, or as brief as I can at least, <laughs> I'll try to show how this has occurred within my work. Um, uh, and of course my work here, and I will, I will speak about this uh, in the next slides, has been developed mainly through collaborations, I should say. 
So I will speak to how uh, three particular mediums have been uh, essential, uh, let's say, in, in my work in shaping my own understanding of a set of buildings, or of three sets of buildings, if you want. Uh, so, in the, the, the as spaces, um, within courtyards in 18th century Naples, on the left, uh, the work of Filippo Brunelleschi in Renaissance florists in the center for drawings, and on the right, um, models of Michelangelo's work in Rome and Florence, uh, especially at two buildings, um, the Palazzo di Conservatore of the Capitoline Hill and the uh, Laurentian Library. So, photographs, drawings, and models. Huh? The talk will be structured also in these three sort of chapters. Um, these three um, pieces of research um, were, in fact, all developed at, while I, I was at the AA and all published in the AA files uh, under its previous editor, uh, Tom Weaver. Um, and their titles are Snails and Hot Wings, uh, number 69, Do You Remember Counter Revolution, which is an article actually by Pier Vittorio Aurelli, your history teacher, for, for whom I produced the drawings. And lastly, Sentimental Education. Um, and of course, in Snails and Hot Wings, the one on the left, you see beneath uh, with photographs by Sue Barr because the most, I would say, one of the most important aspects of the project was really working with Sue in collaboration with Subar to develop a series of photographs which could uh, encapsulate um, the, um, let's say, my, my reading of, of, uh, of, of, of this particular urban phenomenon, which are uh, the stairs of 18th century Naples. So we'll start with that. And now, my, my fascination for this topic came actually from an obsession with a single building, which you see here uh, highlighted in red. Um, we are here in, in around the 1760s, more or less. Uh, this map was made in the 1760s in an area north of Naples. And the, in red, you see highlighted a palace, which an architect constructed for himself in the 1720s. Uh, the architect is called Ferdinando San Felice. It is a uh, peculiar palace, uh, rather dull from outside, uh, not especially, uh, how do you say, grand in terms of its ornamentation. It has no orders, for example, on the facade, uh, only, let's say, elaborate uh, sort of ornaments around the portals and the windows, but truly, uh, let's say, not a building which um, you are stunned by, for example, when, as, as when you, I don't know, walk in front of, um, a palace facade by Alberti or Michelangelo or Palladio and so forth. And now my interest in the, in the building, in fact, has less to do with its, with its elevation on the street, but rather with its quite peculiar uh, uh, architecture of the cortili, the courtyards within. So you see the plan is divided in two parts. So it's, it's almost like a palace, uh, which is a double palace. So two courtyards structure the palace, and behind these two courtyards, you see two very prominent staircases. So on the left, um, you can see here the two portals of the palace, which have two means of access, although the building was uh, owned by a single owner. And on the left of the portal, you can see leads onto a staircase, um, which starts from a single flight and then bifurcates uh, within, within a sort of interior uh, how do you say, a bundle of passageways uh, and coils. And on the right, instead, you see a similar stair, which nevertheless is more flat in terms of its architecture. So where you arrive at a single point and then you raise on the two sides um, to then return upon yourself orders. And that, I'll show you more of this soon. So the stair on the left is usually called, uh, or was described by uh, the biographer of the architect as a snail staircase. Um, so as you see from the photograph on the right, took, took by uh, Tim Benton, who was also actually uh, very much involved with the AA in, in the late 20th century. Um, these are a series of photographs he took for the historian um, Anthony Blunt, who did a book on Naples, um, Naples' Baroque architecture. So you can see the stair starts from a single flight. And then you can observe in the plan on the left, it basically um, bifurcates. So it, it, you can go in either direction to kind of return upon yourself in a stair hall above. So the plan on the left is a tricky one because the, the, the double stair is, is cut in two in the plan. And one, one half shows the plan at ground level and the other half the plan at the level when you arrive up. Huh? So don't be confused by that. 
um, when you arrive up, as I said, you as I said again. So you if, imagine you were two people. You arrive at the stair. One takes the right hand side. One takes the left hand side. You do a full turn upon yourself. You arrive at a landing, which is condition of this kind of promenade within a grand sort of stair hall, uh, to which you can then access two doors again within the palace. So this is a snail. The second stair, which, I, which is perhaps even more bizarre and innovative, um, is what um, San Felice's biographer calls a hawkwing snail, a stair. Hawkwing because its profile is analogous to that of a bird whose wings are open, uh, yeah, whose wings are stretched out. And that figure repeated multiple times uh, throughout the height of the stair. So the stair is like a loggia element pushed at the very back of the courtyard. And is uh, it's a, it's it's in a way it's it's two symmetric staircases basically um, um, placed or, or placed back to back or actually front to front huh, along the central axis. So you you travel like this, and uh, everything is permeable. Um, the element is a massive structure, but there are always these oblique windows which follows the which follow the geometry of the stair, which make it also a permeable, uh, almost like a loggia leading onto the garden behind. And you can see how this element is in fact so exceptional that it is, uh, it is, it is also and especially much more interesting even the, than the facade of the building. So in a way, it's as if the facade of this building is pushed back towards the end of the courtyard. Now, here you see, for example, um, an image of um, let's say the experience one might have in rising above the stair which is entirely vaulted huh? with very complex geometric uh, patterns, uh, certainly complex to construct at the time. Now, I, of course, after I began studying this building, I, I, I went to read uh, what historians had written about it in history books, especially, and, uh, and found out that most of the histories uh, of this building uh, try to compare or find, let's say, its sources of inspiration in architectures which preceded it. So for example, here you have a, a section of a staircase in a building by Palladio, which is said to have influenced uh, San Felice's design. Um, it was made around 150 years beforehand. Or on the right, for instance, a palace, well, the, actually the entrance to a monastery in uh, San Florian, uh, near, Viet near Vienna, began in 1708, uh, where you see the same sort of um, uh, the same motif no, of arriving at a single point and rising symmetrically to the side with kind of oblique windows and so forth. Now, of course, these readings influenced me a lot, but in my own research, what I was interested in more somehow was the extent to which this stair uh, was mirrored in other stairs throughout the city. So, in fact, um, it is a model which uh, you can find in a countless amount of courtyards in Naples. And the big question was really, why did it become such a popular sort of architectural device? Uh, why was it so widely used in Naples and not at all in other Italian cities, for example? Um, and my reading of it, uh, in a way, has very much to do with Naples' development through time. So Naples is a city which, until the 1740s, let's say, when its city walls were torn down, um, it was a city whose growth was limited by law. So where you could only, uh, let's say, develop the city in height rather than in extent, which meant that buildings became incredibly high. And, uh, and since, let's say, uh, client or patrons or nobles or church institutions and so forth could not build outside the city, every inch of the city was extremely valuable in real estate terms. So streets, the public, let's say, aspects or the public elements in the city were extremely tiny and buildings extremely large and extremely tall in order to profit, let's say, or in order to kind of um, develop, uh, uh, develop um, how do you say this, or in order to use as much space as it was, as it was possible. And in this, in this kind of hyper-dense uh, urban context, which you can see pictured here, uh, it's still visible today if you visit Naples, in the picture in the center, these stairs somehow um, acted as the true monumental facades of the buildings within the courtyards. Huh? 
where instead more space was given in order to allow, allow air to circulate, for carriages to kind of drop off their wealthy patrons and so forth. So the facades of the building, especially in these narrow alleys, become uh, very, uh, have very little importance, uh, as opposed instead to these kind of elements which are pushed back at the end of the courtyards and which you can see from portal, no? from have more depth somehow. So I, I was interested in this, in this very peculiar sort of uh, architectural expedient. And now, as, as I kind of became more familiar with this kind of work and, it's, and above all its seriality, so the fact that it was repeated at different points or that, that one could find elements of this sort in different palaces in the city, I began to think of a, uh, a photographic or of documenting. I thought maybe I should draw it, maybe I should model it. But in fact, um, the, 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 let's say the, the way of looking at these buildings which intrigued me more was photography. Um, and especially at the time, I was very much intrigued by the work of these two uh, German photographers, Berg and Hilo Becker, who developed a series of works uh, which were precisely concentrated or focused on this idea of seriality. No? Uh, so creating matrices of structure which had some form of um, not just functional um, um, relations between each other, but also formal resemblance. So you see, for example, uh, water towers on the left, uh, all of course formed by uh, the principles of or the requirements of storing water on top and built in concrete. Uh, framework houses in the center, which are all built with a single um, sort of building technique and therefore um, highly, let's say, uniform in terms of their geometry and whatnot. And on the right, winding towers, which uh, of course one could say the very same thing as for the water towers at the beginning. So I was interested in this way of, uh, let's say, photographing objects from a very sort of, uh, how do you say, uh, rigorous perspective and, and it, with, a, with an extremely sort of, uh, how do you say, repetitive frame in order to emphasize their similarity amongst each other. So I immediately involved Subar and we developed a project for photographing these stairs in Naples which could create a, uh, let's say, a polyptic or a polyrama of sort of a single urban phenomenon uh, through the medium of photography. So this was, of course, a very challenging project uh, because, of course, achieving photographs of this sort is not like entering with a uh, iPhone camera in a building and taking some shots around. First of all, it requires planning. So it requires weeks of planning to identify all the buildings you want to shoot, uh, it requires, for example, creating itineraries in order to kind of, uh, maximize the sort of time efficiency, while you, time efficiency while you develop the project. It also requires uh, um, uh, gathering the contacts, for example, of the people who, lives in, who live in these buildings. So that when you arrive with all your equipment, someone will let you in. These are all mostly either private dwellings or religious institutions. So, for example, in this photograph, Sue and I are uh, in a um, actually a convent uh, <laughs> of nuns and they had to make an exceptional arrangement for me to enter uh, and I could only enter at ground level while Sue was also able to go up since she was of course a female. Um, so of course going around the city with ladders, tripods, suitcases of equipment in order to realize what may perhaps be a very may be perceived as a very simple uh, kind of outcome, but in fact it is uh, weeks or months even of hard work to achieve it somehow. Um, and it's important to do it with a, with a certain kind of rigor and attention to quality and detail. So we went around and identified uh, or let's say started to plan, let's say, series of photographies, whether in triptychs, diptychs or singular photographs, which could really bring out the analogies or the interrelations of these building elements. So always you will see all the, all the photographs are framed from the arch uh, of the entryway as, as if to create a sort of, uh, almost like a, um, how do you say, a, a matting you know, of sorts to the photograph, like those you put on, on prints in order to cover the edges and to kind of uniform the viewpoint you know, on the single case studies which are analyzed. So here you see a series of snails, you know, these, these staircases which coil onto themselves, spiral stair staircases really. Um, here, for example, you see a hybrid, hybrid types between loggias and hot wings, um, which we identified in a number of buildings. I'm showing here only a selection, a small selection, obviously. 
Here, of course, the more kind of uh, uh, expressive hawkwing types. And, and you can see, for instance, in the central, central photographs, the challenges which are involved uh, in photographing these buildings. Of course, the, on the day we planned to be, at the time we planned to be at that particular palace, uh, there was a truck in the middle, and for two hours this truck would not move. So, in a way, we had to also. <laughs> Um, how do you say, cope with that. We created uh, matrices of details to observe, for example, how the general array of, uh, arrangement of the stair um, affected the way in which the precise, let's say, detailing of the moldings and the capitals, the, the pilaster capitals were developed within the stairs, so how each of these elements are distorted and how each architect kind of distorts them slightly differently. Uh, the detailing of openings, in this case within a single building, for example, from inside, from outside, um, as you walk up the stairs and so forth. Uh, we also created a series of photographs which uh, could emphasize, let's say, the symmetry of these stairs, whether in the case, for instance, of the snails, where we, went, we did real sort of close-ups to kind of uh, convey this, uh, this, this, uh, this bifurcation. You see here two examples of the men we took. <clears throat> or in the case of the hawk wings, where we asked even tenants if we can go in their houses to photograph the stairs from the other side of the, of the courtyard. This required a lot of planning, by the way, uh, because you can't just improvise these things. So in, in these two cases, we kind of emphasize through a single and repetitive point of view their formal resemblance. Diptychs, for instance, um, of the interior, where, for example, you have always similar points of views, but from different levels. Here you see, for instance, in the case of the San Felice Palace, and here perhaps even a more interesting case in the, in the nuns' um, courtyard, where you see the exact same view being taken from two different uh, levels in the building. And you can, you can barely kind of identify the difference between these two photographs. In fact, only when you look within the doors or within the threshold of these portals, you see one has a stair leading up and the other one instead leads onto a floor which is on the level of the landing. Um, this, of course, also emphasizes the fact that these stairs were so much conceived as kind of distinct elements that sometimes the architect didn't care if they didn't really arrive at level with the floors uh, surrounding them because the geometry of the stair was more important, hence the little stairs in the, in the picture on the left, which could kind of make up for the level difference. Again, for diptychs of photographs which, which exactly convey the kind of symmetry and redoubling and kind of redundancy of the stairs even, diptychs which are, are able to convey uh, an experience. So it's a paying attention uh, to, for example, how um, you can compose or convey the idea of a single sort of circular upward movement by just by juxtaposing two photographs one next to one another. And, and to conclude these kind of matrices um, in which, uh, well, a la Hilde and um, Bernd and Hilde Becker, where you um, basically, yes, create tableaus of uh, elements uh, which are sort of similar to one another in order to convey a certain, uh, a certain, um, um, how do you say, uh, well, to create families, right? Families of elements, families of, um, of components, families of architectural features. Now the next work uh, is instead, uh, as I said before, uh, a series of drawings I produced as an accompaniment to an essay by Pier Vittorio on uh, the counter-revolutionary architecture of Filippo Brunelleschi in Renaissance Florence. Now, as was the case with the previous chapter, let's say, I will not go into detail into uh, let's say the, the, the arguments of the essays because it, there is no time and it's not the scope of this presentation, but I will rather focus on the, uh, the agency of, in this case, drawing as a means for uh, analyzing and investigating architecture. Uh, but perhaps just to kind of give you a very brief uh, outline of the topic. Um, so we are working here in, uh, in or on uh, 15th century Florence, um, uh, which you see here depicted in the famous Veduta della Catena uh, at Palazzo Vecchio, a very sort of dense and medieval town which uh, at one point um, began, begins to feature um, a series of buildings which are 
completely unlike anything which had gone before, which introduced an entirely new idea of architecture within the city. An idea of architecture which is characterized again by seriality, by rigorous uh, order and perpendicularity, by precision, repetition, for example, of ornamental features, uh, obviously accurate sort of use of geometrical figures within the design process. Uh, restraint in terms of materials. So you can see here the buildings are all plastered white with gray, gray pietra serena uh, moldings, uh, capitals, and uh, other such ornamental features, um, and so forth. And the essay by Pier Vittorio really interprets, uh, let's say, the appearance of this very peculiar and completely innovative architecture in medieval Florence with regards to two um, uh, instances. First, uh, the appearance uh, or the, uh, let's say, the power, the power struggles in Florence between uh, Republican sort of uh, government bodies in the cities and instead uh, a rising uh, and increasingly powerful, powerful class of uh, elite um, citizens, including, for example, the famous Medici bankers of Florence which um, through their architecture uh, or their architectural patronage, so their commissions, uh, began to assert, um, even in an indirect way, began to assert their authority uh, within the city. So you see here, for instance, Lorenzo il Magnifico portrait with Florence in the back, and of course, the cupola made by Brunelleschi, which is here almost uh, interpreted as an, as an ornament to uh, Lorenzo's uh, princeship, one would say, <laughs> or leadership in Florence. The other, the other thing the essay focuses on is the appearance of the figure of the architect. So how, for instance, the, um, the architecture of Brunelleschi, its seriality, its orderliness, its, uh, its sheer repetitiveness, its, its kind of, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, its control, its, its obsession for control actually uh, embodies um, the uh, appearance or the emergence of a new way of carrying out building commissions, uh, which is very different from how building, buildings were carried out or designed or built uh, during the medieval period. Uh, this way, of course, uh, requires that a single architect, um, he who realizes the design, the drawing of the building, be entirely in control of, um, of the uh, sort of design of the building, um, from parts to whole, uh, its construction, and, and be, let's say, uh, how do you say, be considered as the sole author of the book. Um, so really, the, the Gervittorio tries to stress here the uh, relationship between authorship, these works are from Filippo Brunelleschi, and authority. So these works are by, built by Filippo Brunelleschi in a certain way that they, com they can convey the authority of those patrons who commission, such as the Medici, for example. Now, the, 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 my, my work, let's say, for this, this essay, uh, my, draw, my drawings for this essay were very varied and, of course, uh, had to do very much with also illustrating, uh, let's say, the Victoria's arguments throughout the text. Um, they include, for example, reconstructions of maps of uh, 15th century Florence, with uh, Brunelleschi's buildings highlighted, as you can see on the right. So this is a, is a, is a figure ground map, it's called, so with, where the blocks are drawn in black and the, the rest is left white, uh, where I introduced uh, in axonometric projection the, all those building commissions uh, realized by Brunelleschi. So you can see, for instance, the Foundling Hospital uh, top left, the, the dome of Santa Maria del Fiore in the center, uh, the Cappella Pazzi top right, bottom left, uh, the Church of and Sacristy of San Lorenzo, bottom right, um, so that's, that was out of the map, so I, I included it in a sort of rectangle, the Church of Santo Spirito. From here, um, uh, Vittorio and I also tried to uh, develop a series of drawings which could convey the state at which Brunelleschi's buildings were uh, by the time of their completion. So this is, for instance, uh, on the left, a drawing of Brunelleschi's founding hospital um, in the year 1427, uh, based on a, a reconstruction by an Italian historian. So, to produce this drawing, of course, is not just a matter of finding um, or of, of, of drawing the building as it is, or finding, let's say, uh, a, a source online which, uh, which you can simply trace. 
because of course the building nowadays looks very different from the one from how it looked in the 15th century. Additions are made, elements are changed, um, and so forth. So it requires researching and it requires even comparing, for example, the drawings or the interpretations of multiple historians to understand uh, or to judge and to evaluate by yourself uh, just which plan is or which reconstruction is the most convincing and for what reason. So it's, it, it's, a look, it's a work which again looks fairly simple but which in fact requires incredible rigor and sort of uh, knowledge of the material. Um, so here, for instance, is the, the facade we, re we redrew or agreed on uh, for depicting the building as it was in, uh, in Brunelleschi's time. The same amount of work went into, for example, drawing these uh, rather simple plans, one could say, of Brunelleschi's principal uh, church spaces. Now, if you Google any of these two churches, you will find probably for each of them around 20 different plans each different in terms of their measurements, in terms of the amount of details, in terms of even um, how certain elements are, are deployed within the building or are, are drawn within the building. So here too, it, it, it really requires comparing the, all this incredible amount of material you find online and trying to find, uh, let's say, either a middle point or uh, trying to identify a, a, the most rigorous um, sort of uh, existing depictions in order to base your own drawings on, and and really also um, to uh, well to also to understand, let's say how um, well the systems through which these churches were designed. In a way, what what is I think fantastic of these two plans is that you you really when you draw them you really start to understand that uh, it's it's not just a matter of tracing, uh, because um, in fact. You need to only understand certain parts of these buildings yeah, or to delineate certain parts of, the, of these buildings um, in order to understand how they all come together as a whole because they are uh, conceived of uh, by elements which are brought together in very precise geometrical relationships which we have even emphasized in these drawings so they're not exactly as built. Some drawings, for example, try to create uh, diptychs of uh, interiors. And, um, so, for example, here you see uh, two perspectives of, of the, the Pazzi Chapel on the left and the old sacristy on the right. And, of course, we could have used photography also in this case, but in a way we decided to use, uh, use drawing because uh, we wanted to emphasize not just the abstract, the abstract character, the design of these spaces, uh, but also because drawing somehow is, uh, is even more removed from reality. And since this is an architecture of lines on flat surfaces, you can make the parallels even stronger somehow. Uh, so you see here, for instance, the, the pendants of the dome in the top, of, top center of the page, which we kind of um, de depicted as almost kind of equal to one another. And the kind of um, the architecture of orders and entablatures developing underneath in very, um, well, particular, but also um, related uh, or similar ways. Perhaps the most interesting drawings are those which I did not publish in the end, uh, out of a dispute with the editor, who thought that this, this was too much of a 1990s approach to architecture, um, are these drawings which uh, investigate, uh, let's say, the volumetric uh, development of this building, or the the volumetric thinking which went into the development of these buildings. So here you see a chart where individual buildings are dealt with in each column and where each row in, in comprises uh, or includes a specific uh, type of notation of a specific element in the building. So to give you, for instance, a more precise example, uh, for each building I drew a, a modular plan, so a plan focusing exclusively uh, on on um, the modular sort of arrangement of the church, or in this case, the church or the building of any building. So emphasizing uh, relations part to whole, repetitiveness uh, and so forth. Um, a volumetric axo immediately after, which shows the building as a whole abstracted uh, in the form of a, um, a sort of uh, cubic composition. A volumetric axle uh, of the principal module, so in a way the, the most uh, important and generative element which is then uh, kind of uh, reproduced throughout the building. 
And lastly, an axle which depicts the, the modular uh, treatment of the vaulting within the building. So in a way, um, with these four drawings, you can understand the building as an assemblage of, of, of parts whose, whose configuration is determined by a very precise series of uh, geometrical uh, and, um, well, um, not just geometrical, but also positional relations. This drawing was, of course, inspired in Manuel de Vittorio's own actual, uh, certainly fascination with the work, for example, of, of uh, radical collectives such as Super Studio, uh, which I, I am sure, or I hope, or you will be, which you will certainly hear about uh, in the coming, in your coming uh, months at, in the first year. But if not, throughout the year, you will certainly be uh, introduced to their work at some point. But this is their series of histograms. Um, now, the, the last drawing, perhaps, which I, I tried to make was uh, a map which would study, um, let's, say the, um, let's say, these buildings with regards to the, um, how do you say, the, well, the, the sort of the grids that gen generated them. So, which tried to place these buildings, I tried to place these buildings in these drawings on a Cartesian sort of matrix uh, to create an ideal city um, structured entirely by uh, precisely determined uh, grids. So to emphasize how all these, the elements in these buildings uh, are some way, in some way conceived with regard to an ordering principle which is much larger than the buildings themselves. So you can see how in this map there are numbers here and there. These numbers describe the dimensions of each element or of each, um, how do you say, cube or, or each square or rectangle in the grid in um, in terms of height and uh, uh, well not height but like length and latitude and the the the, the unit in which uh, the measurements are uh, described is in Florentine arms which was the unit used by uh, of course Brunelleschi in designing them um, so in a way with this map somehow you can uh, this map is almost a key to then a geometrical key to then reconstruct further, more precise plans of the buildings because through these maps, you can have the precise geometrical relationships between each element taken either at their interaxis or um, at their sort of uh, boundary or, or, or uh, outer limits. So for instance, you see here a fragment of the map describing Santo Spirito at the top with its grid 11 by 11 Florentine arms of the old sacristy, oh, sorry, of the, of the Pazzi Chapel in, in the bottom right. San Lorenzo, which was a renovation Brunelleschi did, so where, where in a sense he had to compromise on an existing building. Um, and with, so there, therefore there are elements which are, are characterized by extreme sort of uh, rigor and control in terms of dimensions and their units, but others which instead uh, fall slightly out of sync with regards to the rest. And the same, for example, in the case of the Spedale di Innocenti, where uh, Brunelleschi designed only the loggia and the courtyard, but the rest of the building was already in place. Um, so even showing the extent to which, uh, you know, when Brunelleschi only designs a series of elements in these buildings, even though the rest of the building is rather random in its configuration and has to do with the urban fabric it is um, cited in, um, there is an extreme control of the fragment, almost as if uh, it has implications much larger than its finite form. And of course, these drawings too were in, 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 in many ways influenced by uh, a set of drawings uh, made by another Italian collective from the 60s and 70s called Archizum, who developed, uh, let's say on the left, for example, a hypothesis for a non-figurative uh, language of architecture. Um, for example, designing plans with a typewriter. So uh, as, it, as if instead of using a pen and uh, I don't know, pencil and rulers, you use somehow the, the digits of a uh, keyboard and the spacings which are uh, produced every time you hit the spacebar as a sort of ordering principle. Of course, this, this, this kind of uh, a close kind of uh, analysis of these drawings inspired even a different way of, of, of drawing this plan of Brunelleschi buildings where we imagined it really as a, uh, an urban landscape somehow with uh, 
is a endless sort of array of columns and elements, lodges displayed or lodges placed in, in kind of an orthogonal, almost Ishtil-like uh, pattern or array to convey this idea of, of buildings kind of floating in a field uh, of other elements. And this, of course, is, is then the, became the frontispiece to the essay, which no longer includes even the dimensions of the building, but it's just kind of an, an, um, an illustration, if you want. Last but not least, Potential Education, uh, written by myself and Alessandro Conti, um, who is a friend uh, who actually passed away long before this essay was written. He was a, he was a, um, a student, uh, well, a, a, um, a fellow student of mine. So we studied together uh, at university. He died immediately after, but then we had developed a research in university and I wrote the essay as a tribute to him also somehow. So this essay is, is focused on models, as I said before, and starts really from a model Alessandro and I had made uh, while at, uh, well, in our second or third year at university in Switzerland. And this is a model, in fact, of another model. Um, it's a model of a model made by an Italian architect called Luigi Moretti in the 60s. The, this model by Luigi Moretti no longer exists, so we decided to replicate it with the exact measurements and reconstruct it in scale one-to-one -one, um, as part of the thesis we developed um, on, um, on the relation of uh, structural elements in uh, Renaissance buildings. And uh, it's a model of a building by Michelangelo, the Palazzo dei Conservatori at the Campidoglio in Rome. Um, as you see, it's, it's, it's around a meter and a half uh, long uh, and about 90, 80 to 90, centime 90 centimeters tall. So it's an enormous, enormous uh, piece of, uh, yes, it's an, it's an enormous kind of object. Um, and it's entirely built out of wood. Um, and uh, the wood is then painted and some elements are, are made in plaster, for example, like the capitals of the columns uh, in the lower order. Now, as I said before, this model was based on a model <laughs> made by Luigi Moretti, and you can see here the only two documents we found existing on this model uh, at the moment, which, which are still around. So our model was, was based on these two photographs and we had to kind of reconstruct uh, the model in its entirety um, out of, um, how do you say, well, not, not measuring these photographs, but trying to kind of redraw what they depict, compare it to the existing building, and then arrive at some sort of, um, uh, how do you say, uh, decision in terms of its dimensions and so forth. And so this model by, by Moretti, of course, depicts um, something which, uh, or provides a reading of the building which highly intrigued us. And it's a reading of the building which deconstructs um, its facade in order to um, highlight, um, let's say, the, 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 the nesting of different structures within each other. So you can see here from the right, if you read the model from right to left, a giant order of columns with to which uh, a smaller order of columns is, is, juxt is juxtaposed. The giant order of columns carries the big beam or, or entablature on the top. The lower order of columns carries instead this little piece of facade which is inserted within the giant uh, module. So, so Moretti is interested in how Michelangelo in his work is able or creates buildings which um, features, uh, which feature a, uh, how do you say, a, uh, almost a, 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 a kind of uh, a Russian doll-like um, um, nesting of structures within each other. Now, Moretti's models are very famous, and in fact, uh, are, they're also very, uh, in, very much in fashion today. So many, many, uh, many teachers also use them as a way of, of, of teaching architecture um, because they're so, kind of uh, useful for understanding buildings. And his most famous ones are certainly uh, these he made for an article called Zip Spaces, which are basically uh, models of volume. Huh? So in these models, it is not kind of the, uh, the elements of these, of these buildings which are uh, realized three-dimensionally, so walls, columns, and whatnot, but space. Huh? 
So space is represented as a, uh, as a volumetric object in order to highlight, uh, as, as, as Noeki says, um, sequences and structures of spaces. So the stru by structures of spaces, he means um, in this particular case, the, for example, subordination of a, a particular series of spaces to an order now which emanates, like in the case of, of the left-hand model, from a central dome. No? So he analyzes this series of works, uh, some more evidently uh, structured, uh, well, some, some which, um, how do you say, I would say, uh, illustrate more evident structural relations, um, others, let's say, more ambiguous. Sorry, let me go back. Yeah. Others more ambiguous, such as the one, I don't know which, which slide are you seeing now? The Moretti one. So is there, is there like a, the, the top, title? Yeah? The top view of the church, the one, the structure is sequence of uh, spazi. is more ambiguous in terms of the relation between the spaces. It's not kind of a central organization which emanates outwards, but it's like a, a, ju a juxtaposition of different elements which hinge on specific points. Uh, and it's, it's an element in um, the Villa Adriana at Tivoli, as you can see probably from the drawing above, but of course I don't expect it to know this building. Uh, in the right here you have a palace by Palladio where Moretti is, is, is studying, for example, the the sequence of rooms and how, <clears throat> let's say, the geometry of their roofs, uh, vault, octagonal dome, um, vault with kind of uh, domed uh, edges, creates uh, a certain rhythm within the palace in terms of the spatial experience of the uh, visitor, user, or whatnot. This, as I said before, is a, is, is a very, well, it's a, ve it's a very useful way of modeling and in fact, it has, it has become very much in fashion nowadays. So this, for instance, is a, uh, a series modeled by a, an Italian professor called Renato Rizzi, which were displayed at Biennale in Venice in 2016, where he does exactly the opposite of Moretti. So he kind of, um, <clears throat> in a way, de depicts the space around, uh, or he models the space around the buildings by showing, uh, let's say, the voids inside them. Uh. But myself, uh, I was rather more interested in this other set of models by Moretti. Um, and here you can see the, the only survival of these series of models which focus on instead what Moretti called I the ideal structures of Michelangelo's work. Uh, so this is a photograph actually by a first year student uh, of mine who was in Rome at the time I was writing this art article. So I asked him to go to the archives in Rome at the EUR where I knew this model was and to take photographs of it. So this is a photograph by a first year student. Um, and there, the, 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 so these models were conceived of uh, as a series. Uh, there were a number of them and mostly focused on two buildings. Uh, the, the Palazzo dei Conservatori, which I will show you a picture of on the left and the Laurentian Library, um, the vestibule of the Laurentian Library on the right. And as you can see with the lettering, uh, in the model on the left, they are concerned with, um, in a way, um, let's say, the, the relation between different orders uh, of structures within a single building. So A is the giant order, and it's the principal structure. Uh, B is the smaller order, it's a secondary structure. And C and D are instead uh, elements which are, are inferior, uh, which are like cladding. Of course, one important thing to understand um, is that these buildings do not work in this way from a structural point of view. So it is not possible with buildings from the Renaissance time to distinguish between uh, main structural components and secondary structural components. Because um, of course, these buildings were, uh, were built in stone and bricks uh, rather than concrete and uh, plasterboard and therefore performed as masses but um, as massive structures. What Moretti is interested in here is rather how structural relations uh, within buildings can be expressed at an ideal level, so at the level of appearance. So he is interested in, in how, for example, if this building uh, looks as though the, the principal entablature or 
or architrave at the top is supported only by A, and the second one at the bottom, so letter B, is supported only by the small columns. So, and, and, in, and in Moretti's view, this, this way of, um, of, of, of reading this building reflects also the way in which Michelangelo thinks about it and designs it. So you can see, for instance, um, the two buildings in reality, let's say, as they, as they stand today. Um, so as, as in the one on the left, the Palazzo di Conservatore, as you see, this principal order, which travels order by order, I mean these kind of columns which are pushed to the wall, which travel across two floors and seem to carry the giant architrave or entablature at the top. Whereas the smaller columns seems to only seem to only support the floor of the uh, of the upper level, right? Uh, it, they seem to have distinct structural functions, which is of course not entirely the case, but from a visual point of view, certainly so. And the same he says, for example, of the um, Laurent, the vestibule in the Laurentian Library, where he says that these columns uh, seem to uh, express the idea of a of a principal structure, while the wall pretends to be inferior, so something which has a secondary load-bearing rule. Of course, these rules are all load-bearing, but from a visual point of view, so in terms of how the design is conceived, Moretti interprets it like this and, and believes that Michelangelo thought of it like this. Now, this, the, the models I showed before are in fact part of a 40-year-long research of Michelangelo's work, which Moretti started uh, at the age of 21. So, more or less at your age. And these are drawings from Moretti when he was a student of architecture in 1927. So I think these drawings, when he made these drawings, he was 23. And they represent exactly those two buildings which he modeled in the 60s, so 30 years later, um, in either perspective or axonometric projection. And you can see how the interests which he uh, discusses later are already expressed within these drawings. So we have an axo of the underbelly of the um, Palazzo di Conservatore at the Capitoline Hill, where you see on, on the left of the drawing, um, you almost uh, start to lose, let's say, the ornamentation in order for Moretti to express really the, um, the principal relation between the elements and to emphasize those as much as possible by clearing the drawing of detail. Likewise with the drawing on the left, where some parts of the buildings are removed, huh? like for example, in the uh, niche on the, in the center left, where you don't have the ornamentation around, in order to show how that ornament uh, on top of the niche, which is uh, in the form of a semicircle, it's called a, a, um, a, segment, or, um, uh, a segmented arch, um, uh, evokes the, uh, the arch of bricks, which in fact tops the niche in the construction of the building. So he is interested in structure, not just in terms of its load-bearing functions, but also is its potential to become a means of expression within the building. So you see more of these types of drawings uh, where he really kind of deconstructs and unpacks these buildings uh, by removing parts, uh, emphasizing others, um, drawing let's say, little di plan diagrams within, within the, um, the perspective, which in a way uh, reflect an ideal uh, an ideal understanding of the building, which, for example, if you see above, you have a plan he draws uh, which expresses two columns in a niche, but in fact, the wall above is a flat surface in Michelangelo's building. So it's, it's, it's Moretti trying to understand really what he calls the constructional sentiment of this building, hence, hence the, the title of my essay, Sentimental Education. Again, another interesting drawing of the Laurentian Library on the, on the right, where Moretti seems to um, want to describe the structure of this building as a cage, uh, as a three-dimensional cage within which instead parts of the wall are uh, infilled. So of course, this, this view by Moretti uh, is also a very contemporary view, no? um, which understands buildings as composed by uh, structural frames and, and elements which have no load-bearing functions, like I don't know, wooden panels, plasterboard panels, uh, um, hollow brickwork, and so forth. Uh, and it's a way of building which, of course, uh, was not at all adopted in the Renaissance. So 
you, you can see here how Moretti is, is using a contemporary uh, sensibility or a contemporary understanding of construction to analyze instead an architecture uh, from 500 years or 400 years before. Huh? And, uh, and this, of course, he does also later in these models. Huh? So where you see, for instance, in the case of the model of the Laurentian library, it's especially clear. Uh, he uh, removes parts of the wall in the, in the wall surface of the vestibule in order to have the columns stand alone as freestanding elements, as if uh, the building would originally, for example, be a, uh, a colonnade which was later infilled by a wall. Huh? which is a quite interesting way of reading a building. Again, here are two photographs of these models, uh, more in elevation, which show uh, the way in which Moretti kind of emphasizes these uh, ideal structural relations. And now, um, of course, one can, one can focus on these from, from the point of view of structure, but in fact, uh, I think what's most interesting about these buildings in Moretti's readings, and this you can see really in his text, is that he interprets interprets these, these relations, not just expressing, uh, let's say, load, ideal load-bearing qualities, but also, and importantly, as expressing a, uh, a, a building which, from a symbolic point of view, uh, can be conceived through time, through millennia even. Moretti's models, I believe, uh, are inspired, for instance, of um, his, uh, probably his promenades in Rome, he was a Roman, and his observations of uh, Roman ruins, which were perhaps, like in the case of the Teatro Marcello, inhabited and transformed throughout, throughout the centuries. Huh? So where we can identify, let's say, primary structures belonging to an, an original building and secondary structures which are added at a later moment no? in, 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 to occupy the building, to make it usable uh, as a sort of infill. And in, in this case, um, the, the theater, the ancient Roman theater, the, its ruins were transformed in, into a palace of a, a very kind of rich aristocratic family in Rome by the architect Baldassare Peruzzi. Now, if you read it in this way, you can also understand the Moretti's models, in fact, as, uh, as ruins, uh, where the letters perhaps on, perhaps on the left do not simply express um, the relation uh, so of, of or, or do not just express the degree to which the elements are load bearing so a the most load bearing b the least load bearing c not load bearing at all but in fact almost an, an order in which these buildings were built no? so he's he moretti projects an idea of temporality on these buildings even though they were built all at, at one moment so as if to say a was built i don't know 700 years ago B was built 400 years ago, C was built 300 years ago. And, and this is a fantastic element of, uh, of Michelangelo's ar architecture, according to Moretti, which is able to construct uh, an idea of, um, of uh, timelessness by nesting, uh, let's say, multiple structures within each other as if they were built even by different civilizations. And of course, Moretti's, Moretti's readings, as I said before, are influenced from his uh, readings of uh, ruins in Rome, which seems to almost uh, emphasize the opposite process. So parts of the building crumble while parts remain intact. And often it is the case that the parts which, which crumble are the ones which have least structural strength and load bearing purposes. So Moretti is also kind of uh, interpreting structure through, um, in terms of its resistance huh, through time. And in a way, when you look at this model, you can in fact read it in two ways. You can read it from right to left, uh, so from the freestanding column to the complete building on the, on the left. You can read it as a construction process. First, a column is built. Then an, another column is built. Then the minor columns are built. Then the secondary slabs are built. Then the architrave is put on top. Then the wall is input. But if you, if you read it instead from the opposite direction, so from left to right, you can read it instead as a, as a building which falls into ruin, where perhaps you say it starts complete and through time, no, let's say every hundred years, some elements start to fall apart and break until the most important ones are left freestanding, so the column on the right. And now 
this way of looking at, at buildings, for example, um, when I was a student, influenced very much um, my way of understanding or of reading buildings um, from history. So for example, this is another model I made always with the same uh, fellow student of mine of a project built um, in the 70s, uh, not the 80s, sorry, in, in Switzerland, which is a, a Lido building, where you see, for example, the complete building at the very end of the model and instead its principle, uh, well, in its gradual decomposition uh, um, towards the left of the model, where you're left with only with the principal sort of concrete shaft, uh, concrete uh, pier holding the, the passerelle, uh, the bridge walkway on the top. And this, this was a model uh, of three meters in length, built entirely out of wood again. Um, so quite a bit of, of, uh, of work. Um, and you can see it on the right showed in university on the on the sort of stance. Perhaps I can just conclude showing you a series of uh, well these two models, uh, which are models actually uh, I made with first year students as they were studying um, buildings um, in the first year at the AA. Uh, in the in this case we have a Don Citroen, if I remember correctly, by Le Corbusier on the left by Tim. And I don't remember who is the student on the right uh, analyzing instead the Varna Venturi house by Denise Frank. Each of the two students trying to uh, project, you know, if this building were a ruin in a hundred years, what would stay up? You know, what would continue to exist even though the rest of the building would fall into decay? And we can close it here. I, I hope I was more or less on time. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Fabrizio. Was uh, was Should nice. I stop? Uh, yes, you can stop this, uh, sharing the screen so we can have a bit of a conversation. Uh, now we can have just a, even like a question or uh, even just comments. They don't have to be absolutely questions. So if you, if some of you have something, if you want to just jump in, just feel free to unmute, unmute yourself or I can just start with some comments as well. Any of you want to start? No, I'm just gonna kick, I'm gonna kick on first. I think like just, to, I want to point out just a few things that I think they're good as a translation for, uh, for what Fabrizio has been showing to what you guys have been doing. I mean, the students this year, because we are in lockdown, instead of having, let's say one case studies, they had six case studies. So instead of just drawing, let's say one, they had to do a series of like re redrawing plan section and sketches. And they just so we, so we didn't focus on one in particular. But I think of what you were showing, I think just, you know, just to kind of go back, I think what is important to point out or to remember even for you guys, is that when you decide to do a drawing or when you decide to do a model or something, I mean, of course, in the first year or the beginning, you know, as a tutor, we just tell you, give you a reference to follow in a way. But I think as well from now, you can start to think what you really, how you really want to draw or how you really want to interpret. Because I think even the word, what you've been doing now, let's say, is you've been doing translation. So you've been translating found material into something else by trying to keep the two very, very similar. Versus what Fabrizio was showing is not only translation, he was showing also interpretation. So when things start to, take, to be used a different way, and then after that, almost when things become a design tool, a design tool when I think when you were showing the drawings that the, the editor decided, of course, to leave it out from the publication because they were already too much almost uh, a design tool and not anymore a translation and not anymore an interpretation. So as well, and I think like when, when, or even like for the Moretti, the Moretti that start to do the models, first is the sketch, but then the model become a design tool and not anymore just a study on Michelangelo. So I think that is what is nice as well to think what is the approach of an architect versus the approach of an historian towards studying building. So do you want to add something, Fabrizio, for the, for the students? Absolutely. Ab yes, abso absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And in fact, uh, it, 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 in another lecture, perhaps uh, one day, it might be interesting also to talk, for instance, of how Moretti's uh, models then are, are become an inspiration for his own work as an architect. And you can see how really the, 
not really the lessons learned because there's there's not lessons to learn from building there are more discoveries to be made uh, which depend really on your personal sort of uh, creative engagement with the building so it's it's interesting to see how moretti's creative engagement then informs for instance the way in which he works in his own buildings and um Yes, I, I, I am not a practicing architect and myself because I, I, yeah, I, I kind of stopped immediately after university. However, I have an architect, an architect's training and that of course uh, is very significant uh, or plays a very, very strong role in informing the way in which I look at buildings because, well, not just because I have the technical abilities to produce things which perhaps art historians um, do not have, draftsmanship, creating models, uh, and a, a visual sensibility which you can only get from architectural training, but also because uh, an architect's training uh, forces you to understand or places you into the uh, position of having to go through a design process. No, it, if you have an architect's training, you know what it means to uh, to start to design a building from zero to completion, and and once you have an understanding of that as a process. Uh, um, as, a cre as a very creative process even, that changes completely your way uh, of looking at buildings because you start to uh, not just look at them as kind of uh, finite objects which exist there in a kind of uh, complete and intouchable state, but you start to kind of with your brain uh, tear them apart, uh, you know, uh, pull them together, put many buildings next to each other, uh, destroy parts of building with your imagination to understand how they were put together, how, you know, what was the sort of creative process which led to, I don't know, a facade to be designed in that specific way. Where did the architect start? Where did she, you know, where did she uh, draw the first line you know, in the sheet of paper when drawing that particular plan or facade? And these uh, are all... Um, Yes, these are all ways of thinking of buildings which only people with an education such as that which you are receiving um, have the power and the possibility of making. Because uh, if you don't have that training, you really do not know what it means to go through a creative process. So you should not forget that when it's really important to keep that in mind when you look at buildings, uh, because it is only in that way that looking at buildings becomes a way of designing new buildings. And in fact, you will see then that as you become more experienced, even your way of translating buildings, as Monia will say, um, will become itself a way of making new buildings, huh? which has very little to do, in fact, with the object you're analyzing, but which, uh, which is instead already a projection of, of something which you think could be um, a future idea, no? a future possible way of designing, for instance. Other questions? I have another, I'm just going to jump in and all. I think there's another thing to point out is this thing of how much time do we spend on site versus not on site. And even here, there are different takes from different architects or different people that study buildings. Like if we see the first example you were showing was quite a lot about be on site because it, with the use of photography with Sue versus in other cases it's more about actually just being, a, being in, a, in an office and redraw something and same thing for you guys just to know the uh, learning from las vegas a book by venturi and scott brown was about taking the students on site and using on-site sketches and photos and the set so the time spent for research was literally on site field work they say not and and not much time was spent then in the studio Versus other architects will say, well, actually, you don't really need to see too much of the building. You can even just look at the plan, look at the drawing and learn from it. So what do you think or do you want to kind of say like what are the, if you compare it with your, the, the three examples you have shown, what was the difference between being, let's say, more on site or not on site? Ah, it's, a, it's a very good question because I think it, it uh, how do you say, it, um, it, it, it points to how um, each piece of research or each type of research, including the different types of research you will do, has certain rules or, well, not really rules, but has, uh, let's say, has certain uh, or can be developed in very different ways. And it's important to be aware of how you can exploit those differences to maximum capacity. 
So for example, yes, of course, photography requires a, uh, how do you say, uh, an incredible amount of time spent photographing, so in the place, but also time spent analyzing how you make the photographs. Because for instance, in the case of Sue, uh, Sue came to Naples and stayed, I think, 10 days, but I was in Naples for 10 days uh, before that, uh, to kind of go check if these buildings existed, where they were, how they could be accessed, uh, where you could take the pictures from, making test photographs. So in a way, that is specific to the medium of photography. And photography in that case was chosen specifically as a medium in order to enhance a certain reading. Yeah? So that, that's kind of important. You need, to, you need to plan your objective when you look at a building in order to understand then what kind of instruments you use to achieve that objective. Drawing on the other hand, uh, well, the, the drawing project with Pier Vittorio on the other hand was completely dif different. I, I, you know, of course I have visited those buildings in the past, but I never had to go take a, a single measurement even myself in person because in a way what we, what we were interested there in was not making the most precise surveys of the buildings as they exist, but rather to make drawings which, um, how do you say, uh, which, uh, which existed at a discursive level. So uh, which talked about, um, let's say, the rhetoric of these buildings, no? how they were uh, intended somehow and how that intention reflected a certain series of ideas about architecture and architectural theory. So in a way there, it was rather a, an exercise in, um, in gathering say, as many different plans as one could find and trying to identify which of these, uh, let's say, was more accurate, not in terms of the precise measurement of things, but in terms, for instance, of the precise geometrical relationships of things or the precise um, sort of, uh, how do you say, um, how do you say, well, the precise sort of um, overall relations between parts in each of these drawings in order for us to then create drawings which do not aim to be surveys. Uh, as I said before, these are not plans which if you measure them precisely to the centimeter will be exactly the same there. They are plans which rather uh, try to show a certain idea about planning, a certain idea about composing or non-composing architecture. So there are plans which talk more about, um, let's say, intention than, than uh, realization, than reality somehow. Um, and for that reason, it's, it was completely useless to go to, to visit the buildings. In fact, it would have even been counterproductive to be, to be influenced by the measurements of the building because then you start to ask yourself all sorts of irrelevant questions, um, which were beyond the point in the specific context of this research. Yeah. I think what's important also, and is different from, or a specific, I think, to how an architect um, approaches the study of a building, is uh, a certain awareness of process and a certain control over that process. You have, to, you have to plan what you do. There, of course, at the beginning, there is always an element of randomness, but within this randomness, it is important to find direction, to identify directions, strategies, um, which uh, are able to convey what you want to do. And it's important to then plan how you're going to pursue very kind of methodically. Um, to plan very methodically the process. Now you say, I'm going to make this type of drawing because I want to reflect this and, and I'm going to be inspired by that type of drawing that this other architect made because I want to show this aspect which she uh, or he also showed in that drawing. So, well, so it's very important. So for example, with, with Eisenman's book on Terran, you know, which is brilliant, which is a brilliant sort of analysis of a building, um, there, of course, uh, since uh, there are a specific set of interests, uh, it seems almost to be the case that I, Eisenman uses a single type of drawing of things, you know, uh, with an incredible sort of formal rigor because he wants to express precisely the incredible formal rigor of the building. So in a way, there is a sort of, um, how do you say, uh, a, a curation uh, in terms of the material or the techniques you, you use and the kind of documents you produce which have to do with emphasizing as much as possible uh, the aspects you're interested in highlighting or developing when analyzing a building.
questions? No question. I'm gonna jump with another one. The don't be scared. Don't be scared. Yeah, don't be scared. You, you can even ask scared. very, even very silly technical questions like uh, how do you, do you do the line weight uh, in that <laughs> in that drawing? Yeah, I mean, you guys can jump in with any. I said they don't have to be even question. You can even just have uh, be opinion. You know, like. Uh, um, and I just wanted to mention this thing of like, I mean, considering that those Moretti, the initial Moretti sketches that he did when he was a student, that was in the 20s. I mean, you know, like sometimes for, I think for, uh, for us, it's difficult sometimes to remember like what was actually happening in education in the 20s. And it was quite rigid. I mean, if you think it was just a few years after like the, everybody was studying the Beaux-Arts. So the, the novelty, of those sketches, the way they're drawn. I mean, if you just look at them, you kind of start to think they're probably from the 40. And you know, like, so they are almost quite, uh, quite impressive. So I would say, and he was just a student. So that's why sometimes we say, you know, when you do something, just, just do it, keep it in your portfolio, even if it doesn't make much sense, especially if you did it and you were excited about it. Because if there is a moment of excitement, it means there is something there that you might go back in a few years time. So I always say like, as a tutor, we tell you what to do, you know, quite often, especially in the beginning. But that, that, that is not a limit. This is only just because we don't want you to be lost, but at the same time, it should not limit your own kind of interest. So just make sure that you, if you want to do something, you just tell with the tutor and you just do it. So, you know, like, because I think that those kind of sketches that he did as a, just 21 or 22 years old in academia at that time is remarkable. Absolutely. And in fact, I think uh, it's also a lesson uh, in terms of, uh, how do you say, always keeping the work you produce uh, while in school very safe. Uh, either in a hard drive or in a drawer because uh, at later points in your life things come back things come back you, and you perhaps maybe something which you found completely boring and irrelevant as a student um, after 10 years you think hold on a second uh, what was I on to there maybe, maybe I should develop that further and it was also the same the, the case with um, with this article I made by Moretti that was a research I had done on his work uh, when I was in my probably when I was 21 um, and uh, which perhaps not 10 years later but like at least seven years later I decided uh, well I kind of remembered and I'm like hold on a second uh, let me re retake this research a second and then I, I thought I should work on it and so I worked on it for another year and in, it's, all, it's often the case with many, many, many things I, I, for example, did as a student that I'm still busy with figuring out, you know, what they meant or how, how perhaps, you know, could they, could they uh, how, could, how could I make use of them in my current work? Or, you know, is there potential to develop them further? I often look back at the work when I was a student. You were actually doing it. I wanted to ask you, if you never finished the drawing, you were not doing this uh, drawing of removing removing the facade or removing things no yes in, in photoshop I was, it was the sort of uh, like like my own version of crosswords yeah i did it for two for two buildings then i don't know i stopped at some point i think because i became more and more busy uh, <laughs> so in a way at, at, at the moment those things i used to do in the in the evening in front of like i don't know uh, television or uh, yeah, stuff like that. Now I, in the evening, I'm usually dead. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've probably read so much during the day that my eyes kind of cannot focus on anything. So it stopped for a while, but perhaps, yeah, perhaps I should, I should, you see, thanks for reminding, perhaps I should, I should start that again. Exactly, so you, you just have them, you keep them safe and then you might go back again. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, go, go, yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, um, uh, it's just a quite basic comment um, that I thought it's interesting to uh, see how in each project uh, you uh, stru structured um, the rules that which allowed you to conclude something, um, whether if it's the uh, point of view of the framing of the of the first photography project or the grid in the drawings or this principle of um, the models that 
uh, you essentially um, timed them, right? Um, so yeah, with, without those uh, rules you held on to, we, you won't be able to identify uh, and conclude some things. That's absolutely true and, and super important. I mean, in a way, um, how do you say, uh, not, not just identify or include, but also express, like also communicate, because those documents are, are also an, an importantly intended to, sh to kind of to te to tell my, or in, this, or in the case in which you will do it, your ideas to people. And uh, it's true that, uh, let's say, a, having a high degree of control in terms of how you want to show things, being very opinionated, in terms of how you want to show things, why, through what instruments, in what way, uh, and how is that way different from how others have showed them? That is that is a you know that is the most one of the most important moments of research. And I think, um, in a way, uh, as architects, again, uh, you have the the sensibility of doing so in, in ways which are much, for example, more powerful than historians. It's right, as you say, uh, in a way, all these projects were a bit of a, a sort of, uh, of a work of conceptual art somehow, no? Uh, perhaps sometimes even, even obsessive and kind of beyond, beyond. Uh, for example, in the article on the staircases with, where, with, where photography was used, uh, the decision was I only and exclusively use in the whole article, because now I didn't show you the whole article, but one, for example, very characteristic feature is I only used images to uh, photographs taken by Sue. So no photographs taken by other people, even if I needed them perhaps to show some aspects, no drawings, no maps, no, uh, no nothing, just those photographs, because that is kind of the only visual impression I wanted the reader to have. No? The only thing, let's say the only, yes, the only kind of on look into kind of the visual that the reader will have. So that that's really sticks to the reader's memory. Um, it's of course different with the other two articles, also with the Vittorio, because it was a collaboration somehow. Um, but yeah, but even there, of course, a lot of control went into the, the type of drawings we were making, the techniques, the, the conventions, you know, do we make walls black or do we, do we leave the infill white? Uh, or do we shade with gray? Do we shade with black? With black? Uh, how do we how do we represent projections? Do we not represent projections? So there's also an in, uh, an instance of kind of coordinating all the materials so that it, it's really kind of compact and and uh, coherent as a whole. Of course, this is not a call to order. There are also approaches where instead being explosive is is uh, is uh, is the the, the purpose. So. Uh, don't don't kind of understand my work now as the work of a freak who <laughs> who is uh, over obsessed with order. Although I am a little bit, but uh, you know there are also occasions where maybe to to illustrate your point, you have to do many different things in many opposite ways, uh, or where you have to be chaotic instead of orderly. The important is to understand you know which tools for which job, you know which tools you choose for which job, and to plan. The way you use those tools very very accurately, even if the objective is chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's I think also, harder, I mean, maybe chaos. to add something, and uh, just because you know, like I think sometimes it's not only when you when we are students, but I think when we are a creative, you know, if we are a creative beast, it's almost impossible to. It's easy to set limit and rules, and to say I'm I'm going to leave something out, but it's very difficult to know then when to stop. That's why I think sometimes in Fabrizio case, I think sometimes the editor was the person that was saying, no, this one out. Sometimes you work with a client and the client is going to tell you, no, you're taking it too far. And sometimes if you're doing a PhD, you have, you have a the supervisor. The supervisor is going to tell you, you, go, you are going out too much of the tangent. So, you know, like I said, as a creative people as we are, it's actually sometimes almost impossible I would say to just know when to stop. So sometimes just you know ha to have say, like a mentor or someone that uh, that guide you is actually quite good. That's why we do it as well as a tutor, as a teacher in general in the school. But just or even you can do it with a peer. So doesn't have to be a teacher. It can even just be a friend. And I think that that the idea of the mentor or someone that uh, give you a bit sometimes the limit can also be good. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, another thing, perhaps, which I think is very important, more for the future, perhaps, but uh, the importance of, of group work um, or of collaborating. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hardly the case that in your life uh, you will be able to have complete control alone over everything you do. So it's very good if, if you already early in your uh, sort of development as architects start to understand how, um, how you can engage with people who can complement what you do. No? Or say, no, you know, I, I could have taken the pictures myself. I know how to take photographs of buildings. But in this, in this sense, I, will, I, was, I was interested rather in, uh, in, having, in, in engaging in a conversation with someone who is really a specialist in that. Um, and 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 working together, and of course, this also led to many other collaborations with Sue. So we we've been we've been um, yes working on on many other things. Uh, she's been asking me to write texts about her work. I've been asking her to take more photographs relevant to my work, and then a conversation starts to develop out of this, uh, which is which is. Uh, as Monia said, also constructive in making you understand, you know, how how to how to how to approach research going too much in one direction or not. And I should say, in fact, that these three pieces I worked on, uh, Tom Weaver played an, an, an incredible uh, role. I mean, in a way, he he kind of uh, my whole sort of thinking uh, and and. Uh, well, I wouldn't say career because I don't like the word, but my whole sort of uh, intellectual development um, kind of was really kind of developed hand in hand with him as an editor because these are the first the first three things I published, and uh, so he, for instance, had had also an incredible agency in editing and saying this yes, this no, uh, and editors are really good people to work with because they you know their specialty is precisely to understand how how to give things. A sort of a form which is you know powerful, comprehensible, coherent to the point. Um, so of course, when I say Tom kind of didn't make me include that drawing, I say it sadly because I like that drawing a lot. But perhaps Tom was right; uh, it was it was perhaps too far. <laughs> um, but yeah, editors, and and of course, an editor like Tom Tom is a is is a is a hyper sort of obsessive editor, almost OCD. So perhaps part of the reason why the work looked like that is also his influence. <laughs> Thank you. It was very inspiring. I'm glad. And thank you for talking. Amanya, do you have time for another comment or are we out of time? Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I was um, Yes, go for it. Uh, all right. So this is a small comment on the part of the intro where you mentioned city planning of Naples and how the law actually limited them to um, kind of making smaller public spaces and the buildings bigger and pushing the facade back. I um, that was interesting that um, those kind of limitations um, allow for like those new architectural um, developments, um, but maybe the comment that. I thought maybe that was kind of, it was poor for the public. Am I, am I breaking up? It was poor for the public that it just kind of limited um, their spaces and the spaces were taken up by buildings. And I thought it was interesting. High city Seoul where a lot of these apartment complexes are taking up a lot of space and kind of taking space away from the public. Um, I thought that was an uh, interesting re resemblance, and I just want to comment on that. Ah, it's, it's, it's absolutely... Maybe, maybe... Please, please, finish. Yeah, maybe it kind of inspired me to look at what um, architectural developments this limitation soul has kind of, um, I guess, pushed or inspired. Yeah. No, absolutely important and relevant question. And I wish, you know, um, there was time to present in more detail my, my precise interpretation of this, because now I obviously presented it in like two minutes. But uh, for example, if you read the essay, you can, which is in the files, and you can find it also online on, on 
JSTOR or whatnot, um, you can see the full argument uh, developed. Uh, and it's, of course, you, I mean, at one, at, at one level, one can dis discuss this as a very elitist uh, move. Um, and, and it was, you know, these are palaces built for the rich. So in a way that that kind of is almost a, uh, a premise of the discussion. So it, it, this is an essay which is not concerned, uh, or which was, this was an essay which was concerned with architectural form more than with architectures, I'd say, uh, broader implication within the, the polity of a place. Um, how, so, so that's, that's that. However, uh, I think what is interesting uh, and what you rightly kind of identified as something which has potential is uh, to, analyze, to analyze how buildings uh, relate to the specific circumstances they uh, are designed in. So it's often the case that in reading about buildings, you will find historians saying, uh, um, and this architect had these ideas and these books and this theory, and then he looked at the Romans and then they did this, and then uh, there was the philosophy of Plato and whatnot. However, opposite to this approach, which is, uh, let's say, a, a rather 19th century positivist, positivist approach which many historians there is um, let's say an approach which I guess scholars would scholars would call a more materialist approach to history where you try to understand for instance how I don't know law uh, moral norms uh, uh, I don't know the, the provision of resources uh, um, all sorts of things things which are really which play really a, how do you say, a tangible role in shaping uh, the built environment affect uh, or determine the emergence of certain architectural uh, solutions or forms, no? So in the case of, of, this, of these staircases, yeah, I, I, was, I was interested in, in, in how they, they uh, well, in, in, in a way, in how they emphasized and developed from a, situ a situation of hyperdensity. And of course, this hyperdensity is not something which, uh, which um, occurred randomly. Naples was at the time in which these buildings were commissioned was a colony. It was a colony of Spain. So there was a, a, a foreign ruler in Madrid who of course was concerned about uh, public order and tried in every possible way to prevent the city to grow in terms of population and in terms of size. Because of course he, he was scared that the more the city would grow, the, the, bigger, or the bigger the threat it would represent to keeping the public order. Hence limitations on building around the defensive walls and, and within the outskirts of Naples. Um, thus the building grew, vert, grew continued to grow because of course the rules are there only to be circumvented, but it grew vertically. Um, so in a way it's true as you say, it, many public spaces were eaten up and consumed, but on the other hand, public space in, in, in that society was not at all, um, how do you say, what we understand today as spaces for, let's say, uh, uh, common accord and uh, collective life. Actually, it was mostly spaces for violence, you know, where troops would patrol and where uh, punishments would be made, uh, where conflicts would occur between uh, military and, and uh, the people. So Neapolitans actually, I guess, preferred the, the dense alleys because there they could hide, you know, they could carry out their lives away from the, uh, the gaze of power. So it's, it's always, you always have to be careful in seeing the, the, the object you analyze from multiple perspectives. I think yeah, also maybe, maybe I can add, you know, just if you guys see the, if you reread the, how the term one brief one was structured, you know, like a few times when we said, we suspend judgment, because if we look, especially, we decided to look at a series of case studies, but focusing even, let's say, on the form, on the composition, on the structural invention, let's say. And we left out thinking about, is the building sustainable economically, socially? And so I'm not saying that those topics are not important. I'm saying that we need, if we really want to open up studies and not feel that we need to leave out topics uh, or, or censor things, I think we just always need to say, 
we're looking at these topics with we're suspending judgment on one area because we are actually focusing, let's say, on hormone composition. And we always want to try for each brief to show you and be as clear as possible to tell you what we're looking on a particular brief, why we're doing it, and what to actually we leave out. So at least you're also aware as a student what, what we're leaving out of judgment. But of course, for you guys, it's important that you, you know, in your own time, you question it. You're always, also always here to discuss it further. Yeah. Perhaps a good book in that regard is uh, Ranier de Graaf's recent book, uh, Four Walls and a Roof, which talks precisely about the paradox of architects always having to work for bad guys uh, while having, you know, all sorts of uh humanitarian ideas about their profession uh, i'm simplifying it of course but that's the gist of it uh, yeah. there's even recently a, an interview uh, on domus uh, of, of jacques herzog from herzog demeron who who also talks about you know uh, about this aspect of ethics for instance within the architectural practice and how problematic it is um could you repeat the the interview part again so i could take a look interview on yeah, Domus. So, yeah, so the magazine is called Domus, D-O-M-U-S. Uh, mm -hmm. And the architect who, uh, who gave the interview recently is Jacques, Jacques, like uh, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S, uh, Herzog, H-E-R-Z-O-G. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very recent interview, so yeah, it'll, it, and it's online, I read it the other day, so. So, um, and, in, and it's about, it's about uh, the practicing of architecture and the paradoxes it implies in terms of, you know, wanting to be uh, an ethically sort of uh, and politically committed citizen, but on the other hand, having to practice and sustain a business even and, uh, and uh, wanting to uh, yeah, design buildings because ultimately that's what most architects are interested in. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you.